I can't believe people will pay money to get video messages from RuPaul's Drag Race contestants. It's like they think we're celebrities or something. I'm just down here doing this in my basement in Rochester. 36th birthday. Big fan. Two count after the beat. Hi, darling. It's me, Mrs. Kasha Davis. Oh, my God on a wheel. Dirty 36. I can't even believe it. You barely look 35. Tony, darling, can you even believe that it's me, Mrs. Kasha Davis, who had the balls to retweet your photo with you and your lovely blouse? Thank you so much for wearing my blouse to the grocery store, to the restroom at TJ Maxx, or wherever you may travel. Happy, happy birthday. Message number two. makeshift studio we've been filming all weekend long for uh, Kasha's audition video for RuPaul's Drag Race Hello I'm Kasha Davis Welcome to Suburbia Well hello my fabulous fans and friends and friends and fans and people who are voting for me Mrs. Kasha Davis for RuPaul's Drag Race Season 5 Now remember you can vote every 24 hours but before I beg for another vote, I'm going to show you a little bit about my frantic, frantic day here in suburbia. It's very, very difficult. I was out pounding the pavement, delivering my Avon orders to those desperate bitches around the cul-de-sac who are trying to look as bad as me. Try, try, ladies. I'll keep selling you that firming cream, but <laughs> nothing works as well as duct tape. <laughs> All I know is I'm ready for a cocktail because you know why? There's always time for a cocktail. Cheers, darling. My name is Ed Popel. I'm 47 years old. I live in Rochester, New York. I have a husband of 14 years. And I perform as a drag queen named Mrs. Kasha Davis. Season one of RuPaul's Drag Race aired in 2009. The whole drag community became excited for this opportunity to be seen on mainstream television. People can see not just a fabulous drag queen, but see the real life struggles that these people are going through. That's something that I had to be a part of. I auditioned every single season and Steve and I worked on all of those audition videos. for RuPaul's Drag Race Season 3. I've got gobs and gobs of sequins and beads and feathers, and they're just waiting to be on national television. We can't even get on RuPaul's Drag Race Season 4. Huh. I have so much passion and love for you, RuPaul, so that I can be on your television show. Because, you know, I just don't have nothing else to do except for sit here and talk to my computer. By the way, 
Don't forget to vote for me. Go to ConsciousDavis.com and vote, vote, vote. Oh, we're going to have a good time. Vote for me. I started doing drag in 2004. I thought first I would create this character similar to who I was. I was working in a career that I, I didn't want to be in, and I was longing to do something else. I am going to work. It's time to make the donuts. I was the director of a call center called Dial America. I had been working at this job for 18 years. I never really had that chance to go out and fulfill the creative energies that I had building up inside of me. I was getting to the point where I'd sit at my desk and I'd stare across the room thinking, oh my gosh, this is it? I am a performer. I need to be on stage. I'm not alive if I'm not creating. The inspiration really came to fruition in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Provincetown is sort of like Oz for gay people. You know, you're going to see drag queens walking down the street, and you're going to see families with their children, and no one's looking as if it's odd. Pete Town is where I first saw Miss Richfield 1981 perform. She would just, like, fly around the streets on her little, uh, you know, a buggy and stuff like that, and we were like, gosh, she's funny. Yay. I realized that you could be a drag queen who doesn't just focus on being pretty. You can have comedy and music, and that is something that's very entertaining for people. Well, welcome. So excited for our first ever Kasha Davis cooking show. I thought maybe, just maybe, you'd enjoy Kasha's Balls of Love. That's right. It's time for Kasha's Balls. Put them right into the blender or food processor or mix or whatever you have, and then you take your cream cheese and you put that in there, and you're all set. And after you get all those ingredients put in together, you just close it on tight, and then you start up the process here with the, the um, mixer, and you just you blend it all up is what you do. You get it all The up. biggest inspiration for me creating Mrs. Kasha Davis is emulating my mom. She was an Italian diva, strong, stunning, emotional. When I was little, I remember sitting on the side of the tub and watching her, you know, put on her face and that artwork. And over time, performing as Mrs. Kasha Davis became a way to keep her spirit alive. I like to keep gas on a Sunday because it's a good day uh, to wear a gown and wave at a neighbor. Hi, darling. Hi, darling. I love your blouse. And, you know, it, Sunday's a good day to get all of your chores done. I like to try to get to Wegmans, ooh, the grocery store. I like to try to get to the liquor store. You know, milk, bread, vodka. I just gravitated to my mom. When I was a kid in the 70s and 80s in Scranton, Pennsylvania, there were no gay people that I knew of. There was light in the loafers. I gravitated to dolls, and I wanted to play theater and dress up, and I was really sassy, and so I was, there were, there were lessons about speaking lower and acting more like a man. I got myself involved in theater, and I found my tribe. So it was a place where I just found so much passion and joy. For me, it was clear I was going to be an entertainer, some way, somehow. But every time I brought it up to my family, it was discouraged. It wasn't realistic. You can't, can't, can't. I was always trying to be what my dad wanted. So I ran away from theater, and then I made the decision to marry the first girl that would say yes. And I cried the entire day at the wedding. And I kept telling everyone it's because I was so much in love. But I knew that it was the final straw that you cannot be yourself. Yeah. 
when my mother found out, and when I came out to her, I said, Mom, I'm gay. And she said, Oh, honey, you don't want to touch somebody's pickle. <laughs> When I did come out to my parents, at that point, I was in the process of divorce. Mom, of course, was dramatic and cried, and Dad just spit in my face and told me to get out. Um, and I did, because it was time for me to be myself. to Rochester and that's when my life started and I'm very excited because I'm doing a show at Rain Lounge for the Christmas holiday Darian Lake season six superstar on RuPaul's Drag Race is going to be there and my fabulous gal pal Aggie Dune see you in a bit well here we are at Rain Lounge and you know just a subtle poster for uh, Darian Lake you know it's the size of a building this is Kasha Davis came to the scene probably like was it like right around the turn of the century. She was sort of a fan, newly out of the closet, so everything was a, a complete candy land. We just had a great time. Mrs. Katja Davis, she is a married lady. She is a housewife. She likes lime jello and marshmallows. She is a little crazy. I love that he had an idea of who Mrs. Katja Davis was from the very first time he was on stage. She is a, a true foundation of Rochester now. And by that, I mean foundation. Uh, she's a brick. But now, I think the first time that I met you two, I went backstage at Mother's and was getting ready in the mirror, and they turned to me and said, don't be afraid to try and look pretty. Just try, Kasha. Rochester is a small enough town where people really know each other. When I moved there, I was like, whoa! gay acceptance, gay pride. I saw rainbow flags. I didn't know what they were. I started going out to the gay clubs, and I went to a place called Mother's, and I saw all of these amazing performers. There was Darian Lake, Pandora Box, Ambrosia Salad, Aggie Dune. And then when I mentioned to Ambrosia Salad that I wanted to do drag, the whole group really encouraged me and helped me to develop Mrs. Kasha Davis. Really, it was a family. My drag persona name is Ambrosia Salad, and I've been doing drag here for, I think, maybe 25 years, around there. I guess that's a quarter of a century. <laughs> you know, I'm six foot three, size 12 foot. I just was like, where do I get stuff? There was a store here in Rochester called La Belle Grande. And that was the only place you could go to get the larger size shoe. And I thought that was the funniest name in the world, the big woman. <laughs> and you paid a lot of money for crappy shoes. Aggie Dune has been around for about 35 years. She's the grand dame of Rochester. So she's kind of like um, the head supreme where all the other ones were kind of they sprouted off of like gremlins when they threw a drink on her after midnight. Kind of like Tasha Davis, Darian Lake, and Pandora Box. Good evening, Chicago stud puppet. I am your giver goddess from the Empire State. I'm the reigning Miss Continental New York State. The Rochester drag community has always been really fantastic, even 30 years ago when I started. When you talk to other big queens that travel the country all the time, they come here, they're always like, you guys have some seriously good drag here. What's in the water? I'm like, mostly chemicals from um, Kodak, but um, you know, we live a technical life and that really helps us out here. Through the years, we've had great bar owners who will stay up till 4 a.m. smoking cigarettes in their trailers, sewing your dress. The winters are really fucking long in upstate New York, and so you're, like, trapped inside your house and you have cabin fever, and you're like, what can I do today that's creative? You know, something. Doing drag with these queens on nights and weekends completely changed my life. 
happened. And it was the first time when I was 100% me. And look at that, push a button. It's like a transformer. Drag queen in disguise. This is my best friend and fabulous entertainer, uh, Miss Aggie Doolin, Tom Smalley. Well, hello, hello. And my God, I've been doing drag, and as long as I've known you, I probably met you one of like the second or third time I did drag. So that's, at this point, I figured it out. It is 13 years. Oh my God. Calling me a marriage here, what? Um, from 93 to 98. So our relationship has it's lasted, lasted longer. longer. Hi, it's lasted longer. Last and hello. I'm back from the dead. <laughs> well, here we are on our way to this benefit, whereupon uh, we're going to be modeling uh, and, and uh, being around for pictures and all that jazz. And it was so early on, like, for me with like, because all I knew was theater and I really hadn't done much drag. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, what's the script? And Aggie was like, nope, there's no script. script. So you really taught me like a crash course in developing Mrs. Kasha Davis, as well as us developing what we originally thought was like Lucy Ethel. Lucy, yeah. Impersonation. Sunny share. Yeah. It was a matter of elevating drag from a place of You know, just the hole in the wall bar scene, and we were able to take it into party houses. Yeah, we, we elevated it out of the bar into the golden pond. Into the golden pond, the the, the Italian buffet. Yeah, you know, high class restaurant <laughs> in a strip mall in the suburbs. Right. So we, right out we, the open. we had made it. So when I started out um, performing and doing drag, we didn't have the internet to um, reference or learn how to do makeup, or I could just go and click to go to dragqueensgalore.com and buy everything in one shopping cart. You had to go out and find everything yourself. I remember the day you had to find out where to buy boobs. You had to build your own things and figure out all of it, which was, for me, the fun part of it. And now it's just, just click a button and there it is, instant drag queen, just add vodka. These are some of the impersonation wigs that I use a lot. So, um, well, let's see, who do we have in here? Oh, this one, she's always a favorite. Don't fall. So she's always a favorite. It's Betty Davis, because everyone loves a nice, sensible short wig. Um, so we like Betty Davis. We have Liza, Celine, Peggy Lee, uh, Baby Jane. Uh, everyone loves her. Elsa for the kids. Um, Barbara Tina, Reba, share, 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 because she makes the most money. Now, I will give you a lesson from Mrs. Kasha Davis. The best thing that you can do when picking a fella is to make sure that he has a penis, a pulse, and good credit. <laughs> Welcome to Mr. Davis in the corner. Yes. <laughs> he, it was a on all three, and I said, let's get married. I'm Stephen Levins, and I'm 54 years old. Ed and I have been together for 14 years. When we got legally married, that just automatically made me Mr. Davis. And oh! <laughs> I think one of the most important things is to help your partner in their endeavors. I mean, right from the beginning, we made the decision, if he was gonna do drag, then I was gonna support him in any way I can. I often help out Mrs. Kasha Davis by filming and running the lights and sound. Behind the scenes stuff that Kasha cares nothing about. <laughs> you're cute. I like being on the other side of the camera. I know, but you're really cute on this side of the camera. <laughs> there would be no Mrs. Davis without Mr. Davis. 
We are a team in every way, shape, and form. In the process of Tasha Davis becoming who she is today, we thought, hey, let's start doing some YouTube videos. <laughs> Now, do you drink, what do you have, darling? Oh, I drink the good stuff. You drink the black velvet? Oh, my God, you're, that's fabulous. Why is that fabulous? Because look at you. Why don't you drink that much? It's just I have it in the house. That, well, that's the way I think of it. Well, where are know. you going now? Oh, Wegmans. Just to the grocery store. Don't put me on that. <laughs> God, what is this all about? What are you doing? I'm leading it in case of snakes. I had my protective gear on. What kind of socks are those? Beige. <laughs> do, do snakes hate beige? They hate beige. Snakes are like, <laughs> beige, and they go. So we have had two weddings. One was just, you know, because we thought that Jesus and the rest of all of the Holy Spirits would just bless us because the government wouldn't. And the fake one. That was, a, but it was the real it was one. Real. Yeah, well, that's the one we tell. Yeah. And then we had another one that we can put on paper. Yeah. We followed up with the paperwork six years later. Yeah. And that was four years ago. Four now. years. Married bliss. And I say, when people ask me, how do you keep the marriage alive? And I answer, quite frankly, blowjobs. And I'm also very proud of the fact that I'm married. Um, and um, back when Mrs. Kasha Davis was created, gay, gay marriage wasn't legal. And so we were talking about something that was taboo. Okay, you two love each other so much. And we talk about it in videos and everything else. But the things that I think uh, is important is that very similar situation. We were both married to a woman. For me, uh, after I came out, it was really difficult because a lot of people didn't want to date someone with kids. It was so funny because that's I was like crying, crying. I'm never going to have children. It's never going to happen. I, this is why I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be gay because I want to have a family. It was really cool because. He not only accepted the kids, he really wanted to meet them and wanted to have a relationship with them. Early on, I remember thinking to myself, wow, if I ever had kids, they'd be just like Melissa and Jessica. And then I was like, <gasps> it like hit me like a, a ton of bricks. I was like, I do have kids, and they are Melissa and Jessica. And so it was perfect. We're rushing after work to go to... Darian Lake's viewing party at the Forum, the Bachelor Forum here in Rochester, New York. RuPaul's Drag Race Season 6. Hopefully they'll do the same for me for Season 7 when I'm cast. I'm Mrs. Kasha Davis. That's right, Mrs. Oh, and I am so proud to be auditioning for Season 7 of RuPaul's Drag Race. Oh, I've been here a couple times. You know that, Ru. But this is it. I am America's Next Drag Superstar. And you know why? Because you've seen me for seven years in a row, and I know you know me. I know it in my heart. I know you watch the videos. I know that you do take a look at all of us gals out there. And I want to represent what you've built for us. I am so proud of what you have done for our community. And I would love to be a part of it. And I would love to lead it with those uh, winning queens, as a matter of fact. Okay, Oh, don't look. Just squish. I, I can 
basically reject the vomit right now, but I won't do that because it's uh, television or YouTube. We don't do that. That would be disgusting. <coughs> but you're flying to New York? New York and L.A. And I can't believe it. I'm so grateful and honored. I can't wait to... I'm going to do my best. Whatever that is. It was an absolute dream come true, and of course I didn't want to fuck it up. Hi, my honeys, I'm home! <laughs> Are there any other queens here? Oh, just me, I guess. <laughs> my name is Mrs. Kasha Davis, and I'm an international celebrity housewife because of that one time I performed in Canada. Being on a reality show, it just, it changes your life. You are under a microscope. The entire time that I was there, you are locked in a hotel room where they duct tape the door closed. You have no telephone. You're working 12, 15 hours, and the only people you can talk to in the world is this little group. You'd look up, and there's the Hollywood sign. And you felt like this is going to be a whole new adventure, a whole new life. When I got cast on RuPaul's Drag Race, I was grateful and excited, but it's a competition. And they were kind of cutthroat, you know, as queens can be. And I'm used to a family atmosphere where we support one another. Next up, Pearl and Matt. And last, but certainly not youngest, <laughs> Mrs. Kasha Davis. <laughs> Did you hear that, dear? <laughs> I get frustrated with our community saying, you're too old, roll over and die. And everybody should be young and thin. Why? I mean, when they clicked that group, I knew it was a lot of buffoonery because they all look alike. They all the same height. They all weigh two pounds. This may sound like old lady bullshit or whatever, but after trying for this for seven years and somebody's like, oh, fuck this, that pisses me off. Yeah. You know, it's like sometimes you have that pop of it's your attitude. Stick. You know that. The first yeah. thing, which is the first thing you said to me when we stood at the table and when we first walked in the workroom. I think about your man arms. Yeah, and it, man arms, and then we'll see if you have any talent. <laughs> I was so anxious, you know. It was the sole thing I wanted in my life. And now, our hostesses with the most to do, Mrs. Katya Davis and Katya. Oh my goodness, everyone. We want to welcome, welcome you to the first annual Despy Awards. That's a hard job, opening the show. That's tough you know, to be overshadowed by the people following you. Here's someone who really has the chops and didn't bring it tonight. That, I find that very frustrating. This is like a workhorse queen, you know? And um, a workhorse queen has to make us laugh the minute we see her. It, it didn't happen tonight. Ladies, I've made my decision. Mrs. Kasha Davis, your big opening was a little sloppy. Call Mr. Davis and tell him Mama's coming home. <laughs> Mache away. Love you, gals. Love you. There's always time for a cocktail. <laughs> up to my personal expectations and to what other people expected of me. I felt like I was disappointing my husband and my kids. They had these ideas of me winning. I got a phone call in the middle of the day and it was Ed and I was disappointed for him because I knew he wanted to do well um, and I know that it was his passion. I was the fifth queen sent home on season seven of RuPaul's Drag Race. It was hard to go home and face everyone. It was hard to face myself. My name is Mrs. Kasha Davis. It's 
turned national celebrity housewife because of that one gig in Montreal. <laughs> now, I don't know if any of you ever have watched the reality television show RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> Thank you. And if you watched season seven, you might remember me from the opening credits. <laughs> in other words, I did shit. <laughs> I have these shoes, and I don't know what to wear with them tonight. I think something with gold. Talk about shoes in a pile. It's like your shoe cupboard threw up. I get told that I'm, that I'm basic a lot. And there's a degree of that that I own. And sometimes it is an insecurity on my age. I mean, look at this forehead, right? <clears throat> well, hello, it's Mrs. Kasha Davis. How are you? <laughs> Good. Who's calling? Hi. I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. I can't believe how goofy am I that I decided to uh, put my phone number accidentally on Twitter. And I tweeted my phone number to get in contact about performance. And when it said reply, I did tweet. Because I don't understand technology. So I wasn't realizing what I was doing. I tweeted the number and then got all these phone calls. Hi there, darling. It's Mrs. Kasha Davis. Hi. Oh my gosh. What's your name? I realized this is my opportunity because even if I got kicked off early, believe it or not, RuPaul's Drag Race girls are considered celebrities. Season 7 of RuPaul's Drag Race aired in 2015. TV definitely changed the game. I never thought I would do the show. I never thought I'd be interested in it. I never thought drag would be a career. I, I just didn't. But I'm extremely grateful for what it's opened up and, and what I've been able to get to do. You know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, they're um, an Instagram queen. They're a YouTube queen. They're tutorials. They had this. They had that. Great. That's what we're working towards so that they can have that freedom. RuPaul's Drag Race allowed people to see that they're a part of something. And I know that's what Rue really wants. With every season, I feel like there's more and more variety of new types of queens. You know, you can do whatever you want to. RuPaul's Drag Race has this wonderful platform where we bring these people in, but there aren't that many spots in the show. And there are a bazillion more talented queens who have not been cast yet. This next gale and the fabulous Wednesday Westwood need your positive energy because they are auditioning from RuPaul Drag Race. Right? Right. I want to be on Drag Race to to have that recognition to to say to all the people who supported me for the last 35 years that say, you should really be on there. I just kind of want to do, I want to do it for them as much as for myself. Now with Drag Race, the crowd doesn't want to come out unless there's a, a celebrity there so they can take a selfie and post it on their Instagram. It's always fun. It's like, we're going to do a meet and greet. Great. No one's here to stand next to me. So many of the um, people here in town uh, that have made it onto the show that I've mentored and helped and been a part of their drag growth and their career have gotten onto the show, and I'm so excited for them. Um, I, 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 I know how much I want it, so I know how much it means to them to get on there, and I am truly excited for them. It kills me that I have not gotten on there. I'm sorry. I, I can't go on with the scene. I'm too happy. Mr. RuPaul, do you mind if I say a few words? Thank you. I just want to tell you all how happy I am to be back in the studio making an audition tape again. You don't know how much I've missed all of you. 
And I promise you, I'll never desert you again. Because after season 10, I'll make another audition tape and another audition tape. You see, this is my life. It always will be. And nothing else. Just us. It changes your friend's structure of what you have because you can't share something that they're doing. So they're hesitant to talk about their success and some of the things they're having because they know how much you're not part of it, which makes it more difficult to continue to have that close friendship because there's now things that you can't talk about. So I just kind of want to get on mainly so I can get all my friends back to the way that things were before Drag Race shifted the entire drag world. Are you frustrated at trolling the internet looking at drag queen social media pages just to find the same old posts over and over again? How boring! Are you overwhelmed at all the audition tapes just to see the same old death drops again and again? Oh, yikes! I'd say one of the biggest hardships that I've had doing drag has been, well, auditioning for RuPaul's Drag Race for eight seasons in a row. So when you first come off Drag Race, it was busy, busy, busy. There were tours lined up, promotional things. I'm going to go on tour this week. It's going to be fabulous. Oh, it's uh, going to be a crazy I know. Industry. Ross goes in Chicago with an entire cast of season seven. So I always wanted to be a full-time performer. And finally, I have this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But, you know, financially, how am I going to support my family? It's important for Stephen and I to continue to maintain our home. Looking at the gay world, we didn't necessarily fit in. It was always a dream of ours to have the home, the pool, the kids. You have girls, I see. What size shoe do you wear? Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I can't get this. So hard, oh. definite diet hug. Oh, God. Fuck it, Nate. Uh, it's so hard to support living in the suburbs with a pool and life. a house and children and money and a convertible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can, can somebody open my soda for me? Can somebody please? open my diet go back oh, to my oh, oh, I could possibly. You see, this is my friend. We really needed to make a decision. Was he going to stay with his job or was he going to jump in? full force and, and try to make a career. We both agreed that we were going to give it at least a year. And if things weren't working out, then he would not do it full time anymore. At that time, I was 44 years old and I realized I can do this and I'm going to go for it. This was just the beginning of a whole new career phase. On my postseason tour, we traveled to New York City, we were in LA, we were in Las Vegas, New Orleans, and Miami. I was so busy. I was able to tour and meet so many different fans of the show. It was amazing. I could not believe these people that were so obsessed with the Queens. I could not get over this. When my season first aired, every time I would get on an airplane, people were like, there's always time for a cocktail, and they would hand me bottles of booze. I was like, wow, this is fantastic. After the excitement of that tour ended, the booking slowed down, and then it kind of trickled, and then there was some interest, and then it died. As time went on, I started to see my calendar looking blank, and I'm looking at my husband, wondering what I've done with my contribution to our relationship by leaving my full-time job for this. One of the hardest parts of being a drag husband is when your drag wife comes home from a gig, and maybe one that she was really excited about, and it wasn't well attended or uh, a number didn't go over as well as she thought. Say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. I identified with my 9-to-5 job. 
During that period of time, I was productive, and I could abstain from alcohol. I knew that I was good at lifting people up and managing people. And then I was literally a housewife. I was at home all day, and I would look at all the other queens from my season who were getting tours and shows and opportunities. My insecurities took over, and it really began to get out of control. Well, I'm so very, very proud to say that just a couple of you uh, were requesting another video. And I thought, well, I have a moment and a couple things to share. And I thought, why not sit down on April 20th and have a glass of wine with my friends on the WWW? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love a good box wine. I mean... It's good for a bargain, and you can take it with you everywhere. They go in toast and everything. Well, everybody likes a cocktail. There's always time for a cocktail. There's always time for a cocktail. Yeah, we're gonna... We used to have an expression about Kasha Davis, when the tangere turns. It was sort of like she was fun and having a great time, and then that tipping point of the drum, and it's the tangere turns. And then she was just getting nasty. <laughs> she was really mean. And we're like, okay, this is uh, time to call it a night. <laughs> you know, we'll see you later. Bye. When you're that thick into your addiction, you're either drinking, you're thinking about the next time you're going to drink, or you're hungover. You gravitate to the liquor store. You gravitate to the box of wine. And then, if you're a comedian like me, you kind of make fun of it. When you walk into a club and go to perform, you think that everybody's as drunk as you. And now I realize, really, nobody was that drunk. And it was after a five, six, seven days of traveling all different places, New York City, Philadelphia, back to Rochester, and I was driving and I was drinking. And it was a really bad weekend of excess. His drinking had started to escalate. He was in Scranton to do a show. And we agreed that he would sleep overnight and then come home in the morning for a gig. That morning, I could tell that he had been drinking before I even saw him. 30 minutes later, I got a text that he was arrested. When I came to the next day, Steve said to me, you know that it was reported that you were swerving from children. We just had a big blowout. I told him I couldn't do it anymore. I was done. And at that point, I was, I was ready to... Um, and the relationship, because it, it just, I couldn't take the, the drinking anymore. for a lifetime of recovery. He just took complete responsibility and started going to AA, and that really, I think, I credit that moment to saving our marriage, and actually, it's become so much better um, because he's now sober and fully present in the marriage. <laughs> I'm grateful to be alive, and I would not be able to do any of this without my husband.
With the love and support of Steve, I was able to continue working as Mrs. Kasha Davis, going to rehab, and really addressing this problem head on, one day at a time. And again, we want you to have those cocktails. I have a phrase called, there's always time for a cocktail. My mother used to say that every morning, noon, and night. God rest her cool chugging soul. <laughs> at any rate, I digest. <laughs> No, uh, I no, I'm almost three years sober now, kids. Can you believe that, Chef? Yeah, thank you. Through the process of rehabilitation, one of the things that did, you know, pop up in my mind is, who is Mrs. Kasha Davis if she doesn't have a glass of wine in her hand? How is she going to go on by saying there's always time for a cocktail? Do I have to change it to, to there's always time for a mocktail? Can I get that level of excitement on stage? <laughs> No, but I, at my phrase, there's always time for a cocktail, I'm sober. What had happened was, is that I was drinking so much, I realized I was allergic to alcohol, because every time I drank, I broke out in handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> it's much safer for the community at large, <laughs> small and medium. I started to look at how I could potentially begin to repair the relationship with my family. I was somebody who took a look in the mirror in the, in the early 40s and said, I'm not done. I can't be done. Let's try lime jello marshmallow. And I began to put together a one-woman show. Hey, everybody. We are here at the JCC for cocktail. Through my one-woman show, There's Always Time for a Cocktail, I wanted to share the story of my life. It's my coming out story. I talk about my battle with uh, addiction. I talk about the battle with my father. Um, I talk about my marriage to my ex-wife. Um, and, of course, the joy of my husband and Mr. Davis and the children. As a child, I remember always feeling like I had to protect my mother. And so I would take a large brunt of my dad's physical anger because I challenged him. My dad was a retired U.S. Marshal, and he tried everything to make sure that I was the man that he wanted to share his name versus the boy that I was. Um, and to the point where that he would try to beat the girl out of me. Oh, he would say, Eddie, boys don't like dancing or dolls. They like sports. <laughs> Eddie, let's go outside and play catch ball. I'm kind of excited because, you know, I have this little bonding time and I do love balls. <laughs> and I'm fine. Eddie, stand over there and put your arms at your side. And I'm going to hit you with this ball over and over again so you know what it feels like to get hit with it. Maybe then you won't be so afraid of it. I was definitely a uh, mama's boy. And as mom grew older, we grew apart because I was coming out as gay. And it broke my heart because we had a, many years of separation. And then she got sick and she suffered from an addiction to pain meds. The damage from the fire burned off all of her hair. And she didn't even have but one eyelash. 
and the long story short, she um, was smoking while she was on her oxygen tank and caught herself, her face on fire. And um, she was airlifted to uh, a hospital, and I just remember walking in, and the queen that I knew and loved was completely unrecognizable. Uh, her hair was burnt off, her face was essentially melted, and she turned to me, and I was holding her hand, and she just said, you know, what did I do with my life? Well, unfortunately, my mom passed away due to complications of the same disease that I have, from addiction. After that, Dad and I started to somehow seem to have a relationship. He began to change. He realized how precious life was, and it was time for us to find ways to mend both sides of the street. Well, RuPaul's Drag Race happened. And you know, you get all kinds of fancy gigs, right? Like I got offered a gig in Scranton, Pennsylvania at a Toyota dealership. <laughs> <laughs> wow! I did do that. How's it going? Good. How are you? He never saw me in drag. He never talked about it. Uh, I see you picture on the paper. You got a show tonight? Yeah. Six o'clock? Mm -hmm. I'm coming. Shit my pants! <laughs> 47 years old, and I'm still like, ah, uh, you know, Dad, I'm in drag. I, yeah, I know, I saw the newspaper. <laughs> but Dad came backstage, also known as the sales department. <laughs> he turned the corner, and he just gasped and said, Eddie, wow, you're beautiful. Words I never expected to hear from a man. I said I was too much like a girl. As I've gotten older and gone through my recovery process, there's a level of forgiveness there that I have to, no, that I've chosen to uh, give him. As I performed There's Always Time for a Cocktail, I started on the journey of really accepting and loving my most genuine self. It can be very easy for me to get disappointed and to slip back into comparing, scrolling, and looking at what other people are doing. The artist who feels as though they can sit back and wait for stuff to come will lose. I don't care how popular you are. Your fire will go out and you have to go back at it. As I'm working on my one woman play, there's always time for a cocktail, RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 2 airs. Drag Race All-Stars returns and Thursday, queens are wild. Hi. Watch out girls, this bitch is sexy. Essentially, all the queens that were cast on RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 2 began to gain more popularity and more followers. I felt like it was necessary for me to get cast on All-Stars to compete and build upon what I had started. It is something that, frankly, I'm chomping at the bit to be a part of. Tatiana and I was on RuPaul's Drag Race season two and then again on All Star season two. The last year has been crazy. I've been to so many different countries. Like, have you ever seen that Lady Gaga? It's like club, another club, bus, nothing. It could be that. So it's been, it's taken me a little bit of time to get used to it just because from season two 
um, it was not like that. But I like it. And I also feel like a fun pop star. I'm just like, I'm just living my life touring. <laughs> Since I didn't do well on my season, and I haven't been cast on All Stars, I decided to do whatever I could to attract the producers' attention. I have to work that much harder on social media in order to get the attention to get gigs. Social media has changed drag so much. At this point, the fans have expectations for the queens that have been on the show. The pressure's on. Fast work design, Davey has come through. With some dresses for this weekend show. <laughs> Mr. J looks on with. So at the end of the show, we're all wearing green. And so this is my gown. Fabulousness, right? Look at that. Oh, oh, oh. Very green. Nice, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Oh, 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 oh. Next, one more. And we have a housewife dress that I'm excited about. Oh. Looks like a tablecloth, but I love it. Oh. Look at Max. It's a housewife dress. Oh. He's saying, not another housewife dress. In this day and age, something that you wear on social media is done. It's time to constantly be uh, updating your looks and finding new things. So. It's a challenge. How's everybody tonight? Look at you looking all fierce and fabulous there, Topher. Put your hand up and wave to everybody. That's a lady, everyone. Yeah. Ladies in 2018-19 fiscal year come in all shapes, sizes, beards, forms, and gloves. It's fantastic. You look fantastic. You really do. You really do. Tasha Davis came out with a video, a music video, so I wrote her on Facebook and was like, honey, where did you get those bracelets? And she was like, what's your address? Three days later, I get this box and I open the box and there are the bracelets. And a CD and an autograph picture. I cried. I cried. I called my mom because my mom had watched the show with me and was just like, I can't believe this. So, like, it was very emotional, and then, like, I have them, like, in a little shrine in my room. Tasha is my inspiration, really, because doing drag in the smaller cities or areas that they don't generally get drag shows, I think is extremely important. I see kids today that struggle with who they are, and while it's not the struggle that I went through when I was younger, where kids are a little bit more accepting, I do see those kids that want to express themselves and have a hard time doing it.
fights for equal rights and recognition, and to be understood, and to be at the table, and to have the same sort of experience that other people have, the more our community is becoming more in, involved with regular outside our community. So it's sort of like a homogenization of LGBTQ in general, which I find a little disheartening. I want I want to be a freak. I want to be a freak. Yeah, all of us. Don't call yeah. me normal. Please, never. I don't think I'm in danger of that, but don't ever. <laughs> yeah, because don't assume that I want uh, that I want. I, I want you to accept me for who I am, but I don't. I don't want the white picket fence. I don't want marriage. I don't want to be in the military. So all those things that we've been fighting to get. And right, you more to that. Check it. Check it. Yeah, but yeah. no. I live in the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> all the white picket fences and all of that. And I absolutely love being the queen of the cul-de-sac. <laughs> And what is wonderful is that I've been able to walk around that neighborhood, sashay around, and I've got you know people who come to my drag story, or other people who come to the, to the uh, different shows that we do in town, and that normalization for me is, is comfortable. So there's room for everybody at that table. I do like that. Do you see the tour? And I bought it, I just put a thank you, because now I've been wearing it ever since. Oh, great. I haven't been able to find a perfume that for every day that I like. Every day. And, and now you, I wear and it. you can get it at Marshall's, you can get it at TJ Maxx. Oh, I like it. Yeah. So I wanted to... I have to fix this, because it makes, it makes me crazy. <laughs> Why do they have these? Hi, honey. How are you? What's your name? Lilith. You're just signed. Is this oh, your yeah. first drag, huh? No, I've been here since you were sick all that time ago? <laughs> Three years. Let's get a picture together. This is fantastic. You're welcome. Are you going to be here tomorrow? I have drag story or tomorrow at 1 o'clock. It's a panel, so come join us. I'm doing it. She's doing it. High five. Fabulous. All right, have fun. Uh, this morning, I was on uh, social media, and what's fabulous today uh, texting and everything. My youngest daughter, Jessica, graduated from Brockport today. She has, uh, she's at graduation, so my heart's a little broken that I'm not there, but it's, you know, it's the way of the world. She's graduating, but she's going to get her master's degree. She's not just stopping there. And she's opening a hair salon. She's an overachiever like her stepmother, father, Ed. <laughs> you love that? Yeah, I'm There, we're good. <laughs> Always a filter. Yeah. My, by the way, everyone would love to see him all sorts. Of Wouldn't that be great? Everyone would love it. From your oh lips my. to RuPaul's ears. Uh oh. Now, this is the point of the day where the foam padding starts to rip the hairs out of my asshole. That feels great. Because it's friction, 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 friction. We won't tell the kids that at Drag Story Hour, though. It's not, it's not information they're interested in, I don't think. Are you going to come to Drag Story Hour? Perfect. <laughs> You're going now. <laughs> this is what happens when you throw something together last minute. Not further ado, and a warm welcome to the best storyteller in town, Mrs. Tasha Davis. <laughs> Isn't this fantastic? Oh my. God on a wheel. I was downstairs. And I was saying to myself, look at all these fabulous faces. And every one of the fabulous faces I saw came up to this panel. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Give yourselves a warm hand. Now, since we're a small group and we're going to really get to know each other, wouldn't it be great if everybody just came down a little bit further down to these front seats? The reality is, no matter what age you are, children of all ages can and should continue to follow their dreams because we have to really continue to foster and be our most genuine selves. Because when you are, the world celebrates it. Literally, a dozen people will come to your panel at Group Monster Icon when you are yourself. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, I'd love to be able to do that for a big group of kids, but they were cute, right? Yeah. In Rochester, the shows that I'm building will have a sold out house. It'll be a packed audience. It's really hard to leave my family behind to go to a show that doesn't necessarily have an audience. And it's frustrating. It's embarrassing. And frankly, you go back to the hotel room and it hurts. Is it you? 
Can I at least say hello to the queen? This is modalis extraordinary. Yes, it is. Okay. You doing all right? You having fun? I am about to lay down in this room. In all right. Corner. See you later. Because I'm like at that point where I'm like. Uh, right. Drag Race audition tape was, uh, you know, 11th time was a charm. Nope. I had fun putting it together, and then I was excited about sending it in, but then I got the, no, oh, no, no, and they want you. I wish they would just send an email with like four words on it. It says, you suck, quit now. You are too old. Not this year, queen. of other people and taking care of other things and putting everybody else first but I'm really selfish with drag because that's my one thing Australia to perform in the Drag Queens of the Stone Age Tour. So basically I flew 24 hours to get to Australia and within a few hours of landing I had to perform. This morning I got up and walked down to the beach and I just went, I had a moment of, oh my god, I'm like 10,000 miles from home in freaking Australia. Who gets to do that? Well, Tempest du Jour was on my season of RuPaul's Drag Race and was the first one to get kicked off. Charlie said she wasn't thrilled by the Stone Age tour name. I'm not totally offended by it. I love it. I mean, what? you've got to use what sets you apart, right? Right. This is what sets us apart. I love it. I, I have no problem with it. Well, if they've called, if it's been called the Old Bitch Tour, I, I'd be happy with that. I don't care. The Drag Queens of the Stone Age Tour is a, a tour that we put together celebrating uh, some of the most seasoned talent to come out of RuPaul's Drag Race. On the Drag Queens of the Stone Age Tour, we've got the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race All Star Season 1, the iconic Chad Michaels. The nightclub culture in Australia is not very, it's not huge, it's still good, you can still make a living off of it, but it's not, it's not huge. So, we're pretty lucky to perform in front of the bigger crowds when these girls come to town, I guess. Yeah. I just wish some of their, um, the, I call them race chasers. Yeah. Because they're the, the, the fans that only come out to see the RuPaul's Drag Race girls. I just wish they love drag that much. Come and see the local girls. Amen.
found out from the promoter that one of the spaces doesn't have mirrors. Yes, we need a mirror. Thank you. And then the other space, we don't have a dressing room. We have to go back to the hotel to change for our, each number. It's, it's really close by, but what if it's raining? The tour itself was a frustrating tour for the Queens. It's called the Stone Age Tour. You know, we're old. <laughs> we get it. I felt insecure showing up and performing because sometimes the audience turnout was really low. You know, it's so cool to be here. Thank you to Queer Touring Events and the fabulous yeah. Keith who's not here right now. He's home working the books or something. The promoter for Queer Touring and Events had the balls to say, do you mind if I don't pay you for a couple weeks because I have to pay Chad? He was like, look, I have to pay him. It's Chad Michael. He was asking not to pay me while I was on the other side of the world. It was hard being in Australia, being so far away from home. Sometimes there are opportunities that are presented to me and I'm paying out of my own pocket to participate. Other times, I am flown all around the world and I'm paid very well to perform with a group of other drag queens from RuPaul's Drag Race. One of the tricky things is I really don't know necessarily what's going to be a useful career opportunity. For example, I flew myself to New York City for the premiere of Hurricane Bianca from Russia with Hate. As one of the actors, I was asked to be in a panel at the end. Look how the art works. We are about to go to the premiere for Hurricane Bianca from Russia with Hate. First time in the movie. And uh, I'm so glad that you're here with me, Mr. Davis. I'm excited. We got ourselves some matching blouses for the occasion. <laughs> but it's been crazy. It was, you know, rushing back home, came home, cleaned, napped, walked back, cleaned, napped. Mr. Davis came home, ate food, napped, woke up, here we are. I hope you have a seat. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have a lot of family, a lot of uh, friends, uh, our fabulous crew, and a lot of really, really fun and excited Bianca fans. Um, we really could not have done any of this without you, so thank you so much. I hope you enjoy it, and uh, stick around. We'll be back after the movie. How did you go in there and come back out with a full report? We're lucky the police will round up the whole fruit basket. I'm Vicky Leakes. I run this joint. What are you in for, fish stick? That dress? I want to bring out director Matt Kugelman. Producer Ash Christian. Writer Derek Hartley. Star Roy Haylock as Bianca Del Rio. And star Rachel Grant. Get an Uber and get food. Okay. Back to the hotel. Take this off. I thought I was going to be a part of the panel, but I guess I wasn't. <laughs> that was surprising. I was like, oh, okay. Well, you know, I was just kind of excited because I thought, I thought people could see it, but whatever.
be celebrating the Lord with a cocktail. Raise your glasses. One of the things that I admire most about Ed, Asha Davis, is he's also a philanthropist. He gives back to the community. He does so much for this community when asked to do something, to host something, to emcee something. And I think a lot of people don't know that about him. Kasha helps every year with, with all of the Rochester Pride events and has always been a huge supporter of the community. Um, so yeah, I'm probably like 10 to 15 years and now, now I don't like to think about Kasha as Kasha. I like to say my friend Ed. Ed, Ed <laughs> our friend Ed. <laughs> you know why though, Wednesday, this is another sold out weekend here at the Brunch. Yeah. So give yourself a warm hand. So we really appreciate you being here. We've been doing this drag brunch for now seven years, so please tell your friends. And I came to perform and work with Kasha, and she like instantly was like super friendly and super supportive. She is like one of my biggest like kind of like parental roles as far as drag goes. This next gal is not old. She's brand new. She's fabulous. You're gonna love her. She's Wednesday Westwood. <laughs> being a heavy, heavy, heavy drinker and Kasha always being sober around me, kind of, it kind of keeps me in check with my drinking and it makes me think about, okay, it is possible to do this and do it well without getting drunk. Anything that I do, I really try to encourage that family kind of dynamic where we're supporting one another and helping to lift each other up. My name is Simone Ayaski. I love drag, loved it all my life. So last June I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I have undergone three rounds of chemo. So we drove for a 24 hour trip to Rochester just for drag brunch. I wanted to fill my joy meter and start living as much as I could. Um, so I have something to keep grabbing from when things are really hard, because I still have a long way to go. <laughs> we went and saw Aggie so she could cut my hair. Darian taught me how to construct my new boobs. And Mrs. Kasha Davis is super lovely. I wrote her and asked what we should do in Rochester. And she sent me a great list of stores and places to go. I feel so grateful and happy. You know, on those days when I'm going to be stuck in bed, I'm going to be able to think how much fun today was and how nice people are in this world. And I'm going to be able to keep going. So that's why I came. I can have an impact on people's lives doing the work that I love right here at home in Rochester. RuPaul's Drag Race created this template of how to be a celebrity drag queen. And it seemed to me that I, maybe I didn't fit that mold. It was important for me to navigate and pave a new way that really matched my performance styles and passions. How is everybody this morning? Oh, that's music to my ears. Woo hey there, boys and girls. I'm Mrs. Kasha Davis. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to introduce you to my fabulous vision, Imagination Station. Imagination Station is a celebration of the artists in our community 
So it's sort of this Mrs. Kasha Davis's variety hour. So it's all inspired by shows that I grew up with, like Mr. Rogers, Pee Wee's Playhouse. We're going to bring people in. We're going to have special guests because, like, how many people are out there, like my sister, Aggie Dune, season after season auditioning and not getting that, uh, that moment? So I guess I'll try one more, and this year we'll probably be like, so I'm Aggie Dune, and I'm auditioning for the 12th time. And that's kind of where I'm at with the RuPaul thing. The more I can do to have someone like Aggie or Ambrosia be a part of what I'm doing, that's really important to me. As a queen in the community, if you're lucky enough to be one of those that are the leaders in the community, you can help unite people, you can help bring them together. I'd love to ask you, what will you be when you grow up? A gruffalo. A gruffalo. Just yesterday. I want to help those parents and I want to help those children realize they are enough. They are exactly the star they have always meant to be. Whatever that is. Now, run in place. You've got to run. And jump, jump, skip to the side. Because you have to practice, 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 and work hard and practice and never give up. It's really something to see. She's very passionate about the kids' show. Yeah, come on in if you want to join. I'm just so proud. Are we ready? Are we getting close? A young woman was telling me that her daughter was very, very shy the first time she came to the show. And then each time she came closer and closer, and now she sits right in front of me. Yay! Thank you for bringing those. That is very special. And I see some beautiful wigs over here, too, that look fantastic. That is wonderful. Thank you for dressing up. There's an opportunity to talk to the kids about gender and sexuality. So if the question comes up, we address it. But we assume that these kids understand. These kids light up and look at you as if you are truly an angel or a queen or a princess without an ounce of judgment. And they look at you as if you're the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. I A lot of times older people give up on their dreams and say they're too old for that. There's a lot of wisdom that comes with experience. Sometimes you just can't sing a song or do a scene unless you've lived through something. A divorce, a death. Sometimes you just can't make it. You have to live through it. And you got to get older first to have had those experiences. Maybe turning 50, but I'm just getting started.
Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mother. You're very welcome. Oh, that's right. Okay. So fine and ready. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that's all right. You're very welcome. That's all right. I've got a memory. It's me. Let me talk. 